Chris Burns, and welcome to The Network, hard talk with the matrix of newsmakers. The headlines. Europe is the world's biggest spender on development aid, more than 50 billion euros a year. Then why so many economic migrants to Europe from countries receiving it? Now there's talk of shifting some of that money to tackle the migrant crisis, as spring weather could lead to many more beyond the one million last year. NGOs say the shift is short-sighted, that reducing development funding could mean more economic migrants who already outnumber Syrian refugees. How should the EU tackle both crises in Europe and in the developing world? And how to pay for both when national and EU budgets are already tight? The wire into this edition of the network here from the European Parliament in Brussels, Nirj Deva. Vice Chair of the Development Committee and a British member of the European Conservatives and Reformists, or ECR. Henrique Banze, Assistant Secretary General for Development Finance at the African, Caribbean and Pacific Group of States, or ACP. And Eugenio Rambrosi, EU Regional Director for the IOM, the International Organization for Migration. Welcome to all of you. A question starting... Uh, to all of you, starting with Neeraj, why so many economic migrants when we're spending so much money on development? Because we don't create jobs in developing countries. What jobs do have we created in Africa? What does Africa have? Africa has agricultural produce and minerals. Do we allow these people to export their agriculture to us? Value addition in tins, in cans? No. In pa process and package? No. Okay, Enrique, do you see it that way? Uh, absolutely. Job creation is one of the important things, especially when we look at women and young people that most that constitute the major part of migrants to Europe today. But also, I think that ad development has to tackle the economic uh, factor, the basic and essential factors for economic transformation. Okay. Eugenio, how do you see it? I would add one additional element, and that is that migration has historically always been one of the major force of development. So much so that uh, remittances for this year, 2016, will be more or less five times more than the overall uh, overseas development aid that this country will receive. So one reason why they move is because it is a factor of developing their own country too. Yeah, the, but the remittances, that, that doesn't really develop the economy, or does it, Henrique? No, there is a debate to what extent we can use remittances had development. Of course, they are important resources for family, for community, but also people are questioning to what extent uh, remittances uh, aid the development because these are private money. So there is an, an existential issue to be discussed. Eugene, Here, that's you... wrong. I've studied this. What happens with remittances is that the same piece of property that was bought by somebody before is now bought by someone else at a higher price. It doesn't create jobs. Neeraj, you're, you're from Sri Lanka originally. Yes. Um, let me ask you this question. Is the European Union making a mistake to divert development funding to tackle the migrant crisis? It's a great mistake, but since we are almost bankrupt, where do we get the money to do it? Now, the way we should look at the migrant crisis is to help the people in the camps, not the people who are strong enough and economically fit to walk across Europe and come over to Britain and other places. That's another mistake. E Eugenio, how do you see this? I mean, th you're obviously very closely linked to this migrant crisis. I think it's partially true. Yes, of course, we need to help people in the camps because they are in the camps. But those who are coming to Europe are not particularly strong or particularly economically fit. Otherwise, they wouldn't be walking all the way to Europe. So I think the answer is much more complex. And uh, I would question that there is a major crisis. There is an increase in migratory pressure to Europe that could be easily handled by the 28 if they could get their act together as a group. So, Enrique, do you, do you see that as a mistake, diverting that money? No, you know, an, an important thing is just what the, the, cause, cause, uh, the causes of the migrations. And migration should be seen as a multidimensional. If we see it in economic, of course, we can tackle. But up to now, uh, the aid did not more focus on, develop, on, on, on migration itself, because migration is just a part of huge. So we have to see also the conflict perspective dimension of migration. And that's what we can tackle much easier and we have to end with it. Nurse? Migration is not new in Europe. Wave after wave of migration is what the European peoples are over 2,000 years. So now, now let's look at what could happen. If Syria, 38% of the migrants coming into Europe now are from Syria, what would happen if what happened in Syria happens in Egypt? Good question. Uh, Eugenio, uh, let, me, let me shift over to this idea of shifting funding. There's also been a shift of funding to 
what are seen to be the more neediest countries and away from countries like India, for instance. Do you see any wisdom in that? No, I think shifting away money from development to deal with migration is a mistake. Uh, it has to be a, a coordinated, coherent answer in terms of migration, in terms of development aid, in terms of uh, um, preventing political crises that then generate major uh, migratory flow. You mentioned uh, Egypt. Well, we already have a major crisis brewing in northeast Nigeria. And what happens if that explodes even further? There's a, apparently a limited pot of funding, Henrique, and, and you represent a lot of different countries. You're from Mozambique, ACP, is all kinds of different levels there. Do you see wisdom in shifting funding away from the less supposedly less needy to the more needy countries in development? No, I, I think the, the, the final solution would be a more integrated approach, as I said. We, uh, migration, it has to do with the multidimensional. We have to tackle economic issues, we have to tackle social issues, we have to tackle political issues, we have to tackle security issues. That will be the approach. I should say, generally speaking, SDGs has approved is one way of tackling all the issues of migration. Can I ask? Those are the development goals you're talking about. Can I ask yes. Enrique a question? Go ahead. Here's... Enrique, why is it that the countries that did not receive EU aid in the Far East, the Asian Tigers, the Vietnams, the uh, Thailands, the Cambodias, the Koreas, have become so rich in a short period of time and created an enterprise, and the countries that were stuck with the Cotonou Agreement and the Lomé Convention and all this stuff are still poor. Please explain that difference. Just a simple reason, because aid development is just the sole way of getting rid of poverty and so on. There are other things to, to, do, to do with that, just because of this. And also, it is important to note that most of these poor people are really below the needed level. So their level of studying is very low. It will take much more time. But surely in Vietnam... Let me shift over to the question of the private sector. How do we get the private sector more involved? Eugenio. Well, I think the private sector is an important element. Again, uh, I mentioned the remittances before, and it was said it's private money. Yes, exactly. That's why they are important, and they are an important element and actor. But I also think that the state should not simply devolve their responsibility of international cooperation to the private sector as if, since there there is the money, is their responsibility and but we can wash our hands. But how, how to encourage the private sector when they might be wary of certain countries or thinking, well, there's too much corruption there or we can't really depend on our money yep. being invested? Uh, what do you think, Nurse? Well, I just got a report through the committee on private sector and development. For the first time, in the 35 years of the development issues in this parliament, the report went through. But I tell you, my staff went through hell because there are a lot of people in this parliament who have not made one penny in, by creating wealth. OK, Enrique, how do you see that? And, and, and how, do we, how do we encourage the private no, sector I when think, it's tough, right? Yes, it is. I think private sector is an important driver of economic and social development. States, of course, they have their own role, but it's a, a facilitator. We should not put all the burden on the states. So many stakeholders in the private sector has an essential role. The state has to facilitate. But, OK, yeah. and, and, and what about uh, uh, sub subsidies of farmers in Europe and the United States some of us see that as a way, as, as undermining farmers uh, in, in the developing world. Of course. Of course. Eugenio, how do you yeah, see I, that? How, I, how, do you, how do you solve that question? I, I don't know how exactly how to solve it. I think it is, it is a huge problem, of course, and it is undermining farmers in, in the developing world. I also think that when we talk about both private sector and development money, we should also interrogate ourselves how well we have used some of these tools. Uh, in the past, and where the way we use them is a reason why they haven't been effective. Okay, and, and finally, how do we how do we deal with this development aid fatigue? There's there's aid fatigue out there. Well, people, are, look, people are saying, we, why we, are we spending we, so we much We pumped in about sixty billion a year yeah. uh, from the member states and the EU. Right. What is required, if you're really serious, if you're going to tackle this, is one trillion, and that can only come from one place. Where the private sector. Are they okay? No, I, I think the only thing, as I said, we have to tackle the root causes of economic development, and particularly uh, in terms of capacity building in developing countries. This is an important thing, and that is in terms of education and in terms of empowerment and so on. So there is much more to do, uh, uh, not only the money or development, it's important. It's, it has to do with much more uh, uh, multidimensional issues. Thanks, Enrique. That's all the time we've got for now. I'd like to thank our guests, Nirj Deva, Enrique Banze, and Eugenio Ambrosi. I'm Chris Burns, and until next time, thanks for connecting with The Network.